few, um, I think Winston's going to show some slides and talk about, uh, show some links to PDX data, so I won't mention that. But uh, uh, so in future meetups, uh, the next one is 9th of May, if you haven't seen the site yet. Um, Andrew Bray is going to talk about uh, collaborative coding with GitHub and RStudio server. Um, all of June is uh, no meetings. Um, the next one is going to be July 12th. Um, and so we're probably going to have two shorter talks. Um, one of them is going to be uh, Jim Walter, and I think it's the topic is analyzing A-B test data in R. So, uh, and then I think I might actually give a short talk if you if you don't mind uh, on um, sort of uh, higher level DSL for HTTP requests um, that I've been working on. Um, and uh, so we have a call for proposals. If you on Twitter, you've probably seen it in the stream. Um, I'll, I don't know, put a link up somewhere. Uh, and it, I, I don't know if I can put it somewhere on the meetup site, but anyway, I'll try and get it out there. Um, I'll send an email around. Uh, and so if you have an idea for a talk you want to you want to do, pop it in there. Uh, if you have an idea for a talk you want to hear, or a meet, a t like a sort of a style of a type of meetup you want to attend, then put that in. Um, yeah, and we're going to go to a local watering hole. Whoever wants to go after, um, just you know, self-organize after after the talk. Um, so Winston is going to talk tonight, and I actually don't know all of his affiliation stuff, so I'll let him introduce himself. Hi. I, uh, uh, Winston Saunders is my name, and um, one of the prerogatives of being the speaker is uh, changing the title. So, Unsupervised Politics, Machine Learning, and R. New title. Uh, they want a, want a little bit of a bio, so here you go. Uh, I'm a reformed physicist. Uh, I used to have a job that I loved and didn't pay. Now I've got a job that pays. The, I work at Intel. Uh, I, I work currently in security technologies, so actually a pretty cool area. It has a, actually a lot of overlaps with the data science stuff that I'm uh, interested in, so that's, uh, that's a nice thing, although I don't work on it right now. Uh, you know, my history in this area is I've actually been a lifelong analytics person. I uh, don't ask, but I used to use Mathematica, uh, and uh, for whatever, whatever reason, and, and, yeah, believe me, I, I saw some pretty badass differential equations in Mathematica. And, uh, uh, you know, the last, the last big analytics problem I did was looking at the correlation of earthquakes and drilling in Oklahoma. And it was a pretty fun little problem, but I realized quite quickly that I was uh, out of the Mathematica's league. And, and uh, started looking around. I found the Coursera stuff at Johns Hopkins. I said, well, maybe I can do that. Turned out to be a lot harder than I thought, but I did make it through there. Uh, been cranking on R ever since. So that's sort of the, the, the history. Um, Scott, do you want to hit this piece? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So I mentioned this last week, but just iterate again. Uh, so the R meetup is part of the PDX data um, sort of umbrella group of meetups in Portland. And we're sort of a umbrella group with a theme of sort of data science, data wrangling data, et cetera. Um, and I think the Python group is part of it. Is that right? It might not be actually. Um, yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. And then uh, a few other groups. And so there's information there. There's a Slack. Uh, if you want to join, invite yourself. Uh, we have a website, and it's sort of the idea is to sort of share some resources among the, the sort of data science-y uh, meetup groups. Great. Well, yeah, and this, this meetup's been great. So I, if you're, this is your first time here, I encourage you to participate. I've really enjoyed this uh, group. All right. Uh, thank you to Mozilla for hosting this. Uh, it's nice to have such a great accommodating space. and. Uh, Gracious hosts. Let's uh, just talk about, so this is, I think uh, Andrew Ng is like uh, an unheralded hero. So I'm just going to make a little pitch for him before I get started. Uh, you know, he's got this full, he's, I don't know if, 
everybody know Andrew Ng, he's deep learning machine and all this stuff. Like, he, dude's a rock star. And, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, he has this thing I read in Huffington Post that just inspired me so much. It's like, if you spend a whole Saturday studying rather than watching TV, there's almost no payback on that, right, in the short term. But if you do that week after week, month after month, year after year, the effects can be profound. And that's sort of the way I feel about my experience working with R, right? I uh, don't get paid to do this. I just love it. And I spend my, like last night, it, anyway, I, I spend a lot of time at it. Uh, not a lot, I spend a lot of time at it, and uh, to be honest, and although I won't admit to it in mostly public settings. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually uh, pretty close to the end of my, you know, the, my career. Uh, but I, for young people, I think the world is changing so fast you have to be able to spend the time to regenerate your ideas all the time if you're going to stay at pace with, what, with this world that's coming with the introduction of AI. I just think uh, it's a competitive disadvantage not to, to learn all the time. My two cents. So let's talk about the agenda. Uh, we're going to go through candidates, of bags of wor candidates as bags of words. Uh, adequate representation, it turns out. Uh, we're going to talk about representations of those bag of words. We're going to meet analytics, and then we're going to talk. We're going to ask the question, is artificial or any kind of intelligence possible <laughs> in politics? Uh, and then I think what I'll do is try to rush through the slides a little bit uh, and then just open up the code and show you sort of what the coding I did is. This is in our user group, so we should talk about practice as well as outcomes. And uh, you know, I can sh I'll, I'll show you the rocky spots in the code, uh, you know, where I'm, where I'm sort of struggling a little bit with how do I make this work faster and some of the hacks I had to do to make pipes work and all the junk that I've just been butzing around with. So, that, so that's sort of the agenda. So uh, data practice. So the first thing I want to talk about is just what I did to get the data. Uh, you know, that's a, an essential part of the process that people often overlook. This was a pretty simple process, not too complicated. Um, the focus here is the uh, text of presidential debates. What I'm really trying to do ultimately is make a, uh, I mean, I'll a Twitter debate bot. So what I want is a, uh, uh, I've done a lot of work on, with Twitter uh, using R before, and I realized, you know, if I could make a Twitter debate bot. So what I want to do is be able to read a Hillary tweet, respond like Bernie and read a Bernie treat, respond like Hillary. That's sort of the, the vision that I've got. And, uh, and to do that, I, I realized quickly that it wasn't going to just be able to do just a simple Markov chain, right? That's not a, that's not a good way to start off. So I, uh, um, I, uh, I thought, I said, well, what sources of data can I use? And I thought debates would be a great format, right? That there, they're kind of, there's a, there's a parry and things like that. And I thought that might be a good source. Turns out the debate text is available. There's a project called the UCSB uh, Presidency Project. It's got lots of text of presidential stuff in there, and you can just, you know, just click on the screen, select, copy, paste into, uh, in this case, into Apple Pages, and I save it as a text file. That's all I do, and that's the raw data. Here's a sample of what that looks like. So let's talk about bags of words. Bags of words is the simplest text analytics. It's also very appealing because it's visual. And uh, uh, you know, R's got some great utilities. I uh, made my little contribution to R by doing called candidate word clouds, <laughs> which is a, like a three-line modification of the standard R function. But, um, you know, already you can see stuff, right? So here's... Uh, Here's a picture of uh, uh, Hillary and Carly Fiorina. I wanted to compare two females. And uh, uh, you can see right away that the, the stuff that they talk about is different. Uh, and you can see this through lots of, lots of the candidates, but uh, I just picked this example as one. You know, Hillary's big word is think. She talks about people, no, going, well, president, need, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, Carly seems to just talk about government, government, and uh, and 
and, and the government knows and it wants to tax and it needs and it's every and whatever, whatever. But it's, uh, you know, there's already some context even in these word clouds of the presidential debates. And it's actually pretty fun to look at. Um, you know, I just, the, my, my thing was I, I wanted to change the colors, so I changed the colors and then I just used the word clouds with, with the stuff that's below and it's actually very quick to do. Uh, there's some surprises though. It turns out not everything turns out like you'd expect. One of the big things that's happening this electoral season is what I'd call populist revolt, right? Big parties are going away and these usurpers are coming up and actually representing the voices of at least a subset of the population. And, uh, and you know, when I looked at Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, man, their word clouds looked a lot alike. You know, it's, it's really surprising. You know, uh, is it just the language? But, the, uh, but, you know, this idea that, you know, the people and the country are going in some place and they think and they know and, and uh, this idea that uh, maybe things aren't going the way people want. I don't I mean, I'm reading in too much there. But, but I found, and this persisted from debate to debate. If you aggregated all the debates, it persi obviously persisted. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought that was sort of an interesting outcome already that there's sort of populist candidates seem to have a slightly different take, at least in the vocabulary, of the way they were describing the problems or proposed solutions to those problems for the electorate. I filtered out, yeah, I did a, did a little bit of filtering. Yeah, there's, there is some filtering here and I, you can, well, uh, we can actually look at what that filtering was. I also, yeah. I was going to make a joke, but I'm not going to do that. This is being published. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's get into a little bit. The problem with word clouds is they really don't. I mean, they're not quantitative. So we're going to now go into a little bit more of this understanding of what's going on and then look at the data a little bit deeper. So first thing I did was I took all this stuff that they did, uh, all, this, all, all that they said, and uh, started counting. And, and uh, what this table represents is a, is, a, is a sort of the order of words used by all the candidates uh, in rank order, and then the counts of words uh, by individual candidates, the number of times they said those things. So for instance, the word people is the most frequently used word of all. Bernie Sanders said the word 162 times in four debates. Ted Cruz said it 24 times in four debates. The word tax, is the tax on here? Yeah, tax is on here. And Donald Trump said it nine times in four debates. And Ted Cruz said it 51 times in four debates. Some big differences in the way these guys talk about what's going on. Um, this table is a little hard to digest, but you can collect some summary statistics. So I like this function in R where you can like type the text below. And uh, you know, Hillary had a vocabulary. <laughs> I think this is damn funny. Hillary had a vocabulary of 2,500 words when she spoke in the debate. Uh, Donald Trump's vocabulary is about half of that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know it. Well, yeah, so, the, so there, there, there is a slight bias, and I'll actually talk, to be fit, so you, you just ruined my punchline with some actual facts, but the, um, the uh, <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, this is supposed to be data fun, not data science, and, uh, and the, um, um, we'll talk about you know, if you've ever studied linguistics, uh, you know, there's a thing called anybody, Zipf's Law, which is totally empirical, but totally works. And, uh, and you know, to be fair, it, there's a, there's a uh, logarithmic relationship between how many words you get to say and the vocabulary you get to use. And, the, uh, and because there are only two, essentially two Democratic candidates, in equal time, they get to say a lot more. And that's really part of the bias. It's not the whole bias, but it's part of that bias going on. But I, it ruins the punchline if you add that fact. I still think it's funnier to say that Hillary has twice the vocabulary as Donald Trump. 
Ab you can ask any question you want. I didn't Yes. I, I didn't do any I didn't do any stemming, um, but I, I, we're gonna at the end of this talk we're gonna I'm gonna rip open the code and we're gonna drill in and you're gonna. That's. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. And uh, I have done the other analysis, okay. but I don't like the way it looks because it kind of looks goofy. So if you if you know what's going on, it doesn't bug you, but it bugs me. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, I'll talk a little bit about those. Yeah, I, 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 did, I, I don't know if I have that data. I did actually look at that association, but I, uh, um, I did do a little bit of bigram stuff and, and I, I'll show some results there. And, and um, excuse me, um, let me think here. Oh, so um, yeah, and, and, and the code, the, I'll provide all the code so you can, um, you know, get it right. I, I, I'm not, I, uh, I like to bias things. So, um, so, so one of the fun things, one of the little fun projects I have is trying to create a heat map. So this, this is actually a, this turned out to be a super useful tool for me because as I started going into the word vector analysis that I'll talk about in a minute, one of the things I like to do is, is um, block out the text. So, so pick a subject, get rid of the stuff that doesn't apply, and then you can sort of see how the different candidates really talked about a given subject. It turns out well, and uh, but this is this is all the data, um, and uh, you know the the so I've normalized uh, the word counts to the total counts by the candidate. So this is a normalized frequency of speech for each candidate, and the color scale on the right is uh, you know proportional to the to the actual frequency. It um, the the median is. Uh, is very far down in the noise. So this, uh, that midpoint there represents about the 95th percentile, just an FYI. Distribution is very non-uniform. There's some interesting stuff already here. Um, you can look at the word, so right in, uh, uh, I'm gonna get off camera for just a second. Uh, the, uh, um, and, uh, you see everybody talks about people except Ted Cruz, okay? about who talks about tax? Well, tax is talked about by Carlo Rubio and Ted Cruz, but almost nobody else. Um, if you look at the Republican leaders, it's actually a fun term to find this Obama is talked about nobody by Ted Cruz. <laughs> um, government is talked mostly about uh, by Carlo Rubio and Ted Cruz. They don't mention the lot, but it's clear that he's the one who's up here. Country, the man, the country, it's interesting, right? You can, you can really uh, sort of see that there are uh, fundamental semantic differences in the way that people are speaking about, about you know, in, in, their, in their actual debates. And um, you, know, you can do lots of drilling in with this technique here. This is just sort of the overview picture, but it uh, gives an idea of a nice visualization of the data and, and G, you know, ggplot is obviously fantastic for this stuff. And I'll, I'll show you the code to, to generate this. Um, so uh, zip's remarkable law. I just think this thing is incredible because it shouldn't work and it always does. Um, uh, people familiar with zip's law, what that is? Uh, so if you, if you take a, a, a text, a big text and tokenize it, and then just count the number of times each word occurs, and rank those, the, it turns out the frequency of the word is inversely related, usually linearly in a logarithmic sense, to uh, the rank of the word. The frequency and the rank are inversely related. So if you just take a plot, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and take the frequency of the data and use those as the ordinates of the axes, you get a straight line. 
And I, I thought, God, there's not very, usually you apply that to, you know, millions, if not billions of words of text. And uh, um, I said, well, I'm going to try it for this candidate speech just to see if I can see anything in the data. It turns out not to be very useful, but if you take the aggregate, you can see here, I mean, the law is, I mean, it's just remarkable. Uh, it works. And uh, so I, I just think it's one of the facts of nature that I'm fascinated by. It doesn't really mean any, it's hard to interpret. The one interesting thing about this is that the exponent is different. And I don't know why that is. I may have to do with the fact that I've done a little filtering of stem word or of stop words and things like that. But it's it, the exponent here is a minus a half rather than minus the traditional minus one. And uh, I don't know why that is. Um, uh, it could be that I just, it's a systematic error of the way I've analyzed the data, but uh, it's still a fascinating thing. If you look it up on Wikipedia, uh, you'll see that, it, you know, there's one graph in there, I think that applies to like, I don't know, a dozen languages and it just works for all languages. And anyway, it's a very interesting thing. Is that right? See, yeah, yeah. It, it's, 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 you know, there's something hidden there. Yeah, yeah. yeah anyway, it's a. It's an, Yeah. So, 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 okay. So, so now, you, so you just, so, so that's where, so I tried, I'm, I actually tried a similar thing. It didn't turn out, it didn't, it didn't mean much. I'll show you a little bit of the data that I got. But what I, what I wanted to do was say, here's the overall aggregate. Turns out it's a pretty simple behavior. Um, can we learn anything from individual, so the idea here is we're trying to explore differences in candidates, right? And understand, uh, you know, can we understand the differences in what they're saying with different analytic techniques? Does Zipf's law give us a basis to compare candidates? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I, that's a great suggestion. I, I don't know what the, uh, uh, why. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I'll show you the code and if you <laughs> figure it out, it'd be great. Um, so what I did was I, I took the individual candidates and plotted their Zipfian lawish plot. And, it, it, you know, uh, you can see a little bit here, but it, it, it wasn't really, really very useful. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, you look at the Democratic candidates, Hillary and Bernie, and, and you can see their, their, their words vary around the, what you consider to be the sort of the, the mean trend, but, but um, there's a lot of variation. What you do see is that as you get out in rank, so about the thousandth word or so, these are these are logs. So about the thousandth word, the um, um, actually uh, actually these might be log base e's. Now that I think about it. <laughs> I better be careful. Uh, the uh, <laughs> as you get out to log three, uh, the um, uh, the, the, there appears to be quite a bit of noise. It's actually probably not noise. It's probably meaningful differences in the usages of words, but um, uh, it sort of gives you an idea of where the, the differences really are. And the frequency variations there are quite big, you know, a factor of, of 10 to the, or well, e to the minus two, so whatever that is, so two, uh, about six or seven. So pretty big variations. In the, in the Republican side, uh, Ted Cruz appears much lower uh, in even the high frequency words, again, highlighting the differences in his speech. And uh, um, again, a lot of variation or, or maybe noise down in the lower ends. It's hard to tell. But Zip's Law is a standard tool. Uh, not too useful here, but there, there does appear to, you know, may, there may be fruit for some deeper investigation if we wanted to get, get further into it. Um, Another uh, bag of words sort of thing that I did was bigram tokenization. And there were, there were some interesting things here. Um, I just picked one example of sort of uh, how you could look at different contexts. So this is the word wall, what appears with the word wall. Um, you know, the uh, title of the graph shows the sort of the grep 
thing that I used, uh, just looking for, ex you know, expressions that started with the word wall. And uh, um, Bernie, it's either street or streets. So he's talking about wall, street, uh, presumably. Uh, Trump, it's, uh, you know, Mexico, <laughs> China, works, will, you know, the wall will work. And uh, I think you know, the context here is, starts to become clear. Uh, you know, he's talking about a different kind of wall than Wall Street. And, uh, and, and that, that sort of comes out here. Uh, the bigrams don't pull out the context that you might think as strongly as, but partly limited uh, word choices here. We're counting one or two instances, and it's not a huge, uh, huge, huge amount of statistics. So candidates as bags of words. Um, you know, the problem with bags of words is that you're really limited in context. You're just looking at nearest neighbors, and uh, um, it's hard to uh, get a lot of intelligence out of, out of that stuff. So I, I uh, was bemoaning this, and a friend of mine said, well, you know, I said, you know, I'd love to do, try word vector analysis. There just isn't enough stuff there to really do the, the deep learning model well. And he said, you know, the, um, Stanford published these pre-computed word vectors. Glove word, have, have any, has anybody looked at the glove word vectors before? Yeah, they're pretty fun. And, uh, and, and so I, I was like a kid in a candy shop when I found those. <laughs> and so now you're gonna, you know, I, remember I said reformed physicist? Now you're gonna get some of that now. So, so that's where this is going. And, uh, uh, you're even going to have a, uh, a picture with some thetas in it, so get ready. Um, vector representations of words using pre-computed glove word vectors. So um, let me give you the cartoon version of how these things are computed. You can, there's tons of blogs on how these are computed. There are really two uh, bigger picture, there's really two competing sort of uh, word vector analysis things, there's the Google word to vec, and then there's the Stanford glove word vectors. Um, and you, I was joking today that I'm losing my memory faster than my hair, but I, I can't remember, one of them, one of them is uh, sort of a, a quadratic and the other is linear. The, the computational times are different uh, to, to reduce these things. They're both essentially unsupervised learning, optimizing a quadratic uh, um, uh, 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 objective, and, um, uh, but they're computed differently. One runs faster, takes more memory. Run one's longer, takes less memory. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you, do you remember which is which or? So that's, that's what? Yeah. So that's what I, I, I think glove work. Yeah, I think glove. Yeah. So that's that's what I, yeah that's right. That, that but ultimately they're both solving the same problem. They just have different. They 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 just operate differently at a at a, at a computational level. Um, there are many examples. Um, one of the things I was trying to do last night, uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm just going to give up on it, was to get, anyway, I wanted to get my, my, the code I'm going to post in GitHub to actually download the glove vectors from the actual glove zip file. Um, we'll talk about that. But the, uh, but the ones that I picked are just the simplest ones. They're computed from 6 billion tokens, so a ton of words, uh, 400,000 word vocabulary. Um, they're actually set, they're actually word vectors that are much larger. It's just, you know, I'm running on a MacBook Air. Um, they, they, uh, uh, the, the training objective tries to uh, ensure that the dot product between two vectors is the logarithm of their probability of co-occurrence. So if you've ever done the Markov chain type of thing where you take the log and uh, it's, it's, you know, sort of the same objective, but this is a, a using the neural network and deep learning to look at co-occurrence across broader spectrum of words. Um, it associates the ratios of co-occurrence uh, uh, probabilities with the vector difference in vector word space. So we're gonna look at the 
cosine, I'm just going to look at the cosines of theta now. Uh, you can also, it turns out there's other meaningful information in there, but I'm just, to simplify things, I normalize everything in a unit vector and take the dot product. It includes lots of weird ass shit. The, the, um, like commas and, and, I mean, you'll see some crazy stuff come up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some crazy words in there that you wouldn't necessarily, it's kind of like the, um, um, uh, have you guys been following Deep Drumpf? Deep Drumpf, the, the, you know, it's, a, it's this kid, <laughs> he's, he, he, he's uh, ahead of me, but he's an undergraduate, so he, but he, um, uh, he, uh, he, he used deep learning, he actually took Donald Trump's speech, and instead of looking at words, he looks at individual characters and uses a model that actually builds, is trained on individual. So, so it doesn't, has no idea of the concept of words. It just builds them out of letters. And uh, it's, it's on Twitter. You can follow it. And it's pretty funny. Uh, it's at Deep Drumpf. And uh, um, uh, this is sort of the same thing, right? Uh, comma. Like, like, I think in some of the examples I show, W period appears. Maybe that's George W. Bush. I don't know. Um, the, uh, but, and there's, there are other things that appear, like comma, NT, and, and it interprets those as, as word units, even though they're not what we'd consider normally words. And I think that's part of... Yeah, 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 see, throw it all in, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 and th and that's and that's sort of um, you know some there's your tokenization. Yeah, exactly. That's the that's the stuff that we should be more open about, I think, because ultimately that biases the outcome. That's right. The question you asked at the beginning was exactly right. Yeah, yep, and, and and that's part of what I'm finding too. And you know, I'm going to show you results, and you're going to, you know, reproducibility and all these things are very subjective, and uh, it's this is this is hard stuff. And uh, at at deep d e e p drumpf d r u m p f I think. Yeah, I think that's it. And he's got another one, um, I think it's either, Ber I think it's Bernie, and I don't know what Bernie's is, but um, they're pretty funny to follow. Um, anyway, this is, this is what the glove vectors do. Uh, this sounds pretty formal. What I did was download a zip file. Um, so what are word vectors? So um, the first thing I did when I downloaded these things was I just reproduced a few canonical examples. So um, have, has anybody played or, I, I, yeah, I mean, a couple people have. So, uh, um, so the idea is uh, word vectors establish, work on the basis of context and association. So one of the canonical examples is, think, of, think about the country England its capital, London, the country, France, and its capital, Paris. And, all right, countries have one association with lots of other things about them, and capitals have lots of... So, so one of the canonical examples for word vectors is, uh, let me, if we get this right, England, uh, uh, let's see, England, um, 
plus London, my, uh, uh, England minus London plus Paris is, it turns out to be very close to the word France in a word vector space. And if you think about that, it sort of makes sense, right? You take a country, you subtract one capital, you add another, you know, very, and that, that's the way this sort of thing works. And it turns out that works with glove. Um, I, turned, I worked on the word king, so this is another canonical example. King, man, queen, woman. Those have associations, and you can sort of establish a pseudo-king vector by taking the vector for man, adding the word queen, and subtracting the word woman. And that makes a kind of a pseudo-king. And uh, so this first graph, uh, these are just uh, visualizations of the actual word vectors. And what, what do those word vectors tell you about? It? Nothing, right? They're completely abstract. And that's because they're optimized by a machine for a machine, from a machine and to a machine. They don't, they don't mean anything to us. Um, the, the glove vectors that I downloaded, they're 300 dimensions, 200 dimensions, 100 dimensions. It turns out, um, when I do all the math, uh, the dimensionality of the matrices matters. Uh, there's a lot, again, a lot of subjectivity here. When you start getting results and you're like, oh crap, what did I, it, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, it turns out I built a lot of uh, machinery just to keep track of the experiments I do because if I don't uh, do that, I very quickly lose track of what I've actually done. And, uh, but, but here, um, you know, you look at these vectors and at first it looks like gibberish, but let me, um, let me just point out a couple things here, and then we'll go into a little bit deeper picture, or a little, actually a little bit shallower picture of this stuff. So I'm just going to point out. Um, so here we have the, here we have the basis. These are all the basis vectors. This is uh, man, queen, and woman. And what we want to do is take a man, add regality to it, queen, but then subtract the femininity to it, and that should give us something close. You have to sort of believe in it, uh, maybe. <laughs> but, but you're going to believe a lot more. This, this, is, this, is, not, this is not religion. <laughs> I think I'm getting punished for walking away from the mic. So um, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned the word religion, and God starts punishing me. So um, what's going on here? Oops. Let's see. I'm, I'm giving away the answers. There. Back. There we go. So um, uh, let me see. So I think I can get it here. So we've got king, and let's just focus on this little front here, okay? All right, so we've got man, queen, and woman, right? And they're all, you know, you can see so the, the structures in this specific area of the vector is different. These are just, this is just by the way, you know, it's got 200 elements, or 300 elements, right? And this, this, the color just is bad. Um, king is very different. Take these things and you add them together, and you get something much closer to the structure that you're interested in seeing. It's pretty remarkable. And you can see a lot of that stuff. Um, there are places in here, if you look in the uh, getting started, you can actually see places where time is changed. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing when you know, when you start really digging into it. How does the machine do that? I mean, this is the sort of mystery of the nonlinearity of deep learning, right? It's, uh, it's uh, something, it's, it's semi-empirical. Uh, these are the different structures for, um, for the one, 300, 200, and 100 dimensional vectors. Um, you can see that the vector families have not, you know, very little in common. It's not like the 300 vector is just, uh, or a 100 vector is just an average of the nearest neighbors of the 300s or anything like that. They're very different outcomes for the models. Um, what you can do is plot these things. So you can take the vectors for man, woman. Uh, here, I, here I've, uh, um, you know, female, male, aunt, uncle, queen, king. And uh, I've just sort of, this is the reproduction of sort of one of the figures that they show in the glove vector paper that uh, shows uh, how, uh, sort of how the vector addition might work. Um, if you uh, seem to be having trouble here, there we go. 
if you uh, have a, uh, um, you take a man, so the idea is you take man, you draw the vector to queen, that's the addition of man plus queen, and then the vector man to woman is an up arrow, but you're subtracting it, so you flip it over and subtract it down from queen, and you end up pretty close to king. At least visually, that's how that looks. And that's sort of an intuitive picture of how the word vectors look. Um, how did I do that from 300 dimensions down to two? It's just, it's, it's actually like one line in R, turns out, just principal components, that's all I did. And, uh, and that, so it took me like frickin' four months, no, it didn't take me four months, but <laughs> it took me, uh, you know, uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do that, but it's actually very simple. I'll show you the code on how to do that, and I, I use that trick quite a bit with the, with the word vectors, but principal components work pretty well. Now, the problem is, is that principal components, you got 300 dimensions collapsing down to two, you're losing a lot of information. So you got to be careful about how you interpret them. Uh, they don't, they're not always 100% uh, fidelity. Uh, they can mislead you, uh, but when you get the right answer, it's a good way to convince people you know what you're talking about. So that's what I'm doing. How do you, how do you know you got the right answer? You use more data. And uh, so some of the data that I, I've been using, this is, a, this is an example. Excuse me, sorry. Um, is I looked at I looked at the dot product of the pseudo vector pseudo king pseudo king is man plus queen minus woman pseudo king and then I just took the dot product with the word king now if you take the dot and I normalize everything remember so if I take king dot king uh, everybody uh, king dot king unit vector what's the dot product One, a vector with a vector, you know, two vectors align perfectly, dot product is one. If they're completely orthogonal, what's the dot product? Zero, because it's a cosine of theta. If they're, neg if they're up, it's negative one. So that's how dot products work. And, uh, and, um, and the first thing I did was I took dot product of king, dot king, one, okay. Well, okay, I can do the... Get the, get the programming right. What's pseudo king? Turns out it's about 0.7. What's the, 0.7 is uh, what, 0.7, 707, square root of 2, 45 degrees. So those two vectors line up to about 45 degrees. I'm going to show you that that is actually, in this case, super amazing agreement. And uh, uh, I think next picture. Uh, 45 degrees doesn't sound like it's very much aligned, but remember, we're not in two dimensions, we're not in three dimensions, we're in 300 dimensions. And so that hypersphere is immense. Um, one of the things that I did was I said, well, how does this compare to nearest neighbor words? And this is, this is sort of a trick that I've been using. Um, and I don't, you know, how do you pick the words? What's the best way to do something when you don't know? And, and, randomly, right? So I just take a bunch of random words and I compute the dot product with those. Here's about 50 of them, I, I think. I can't remember how many I used in this graph, but what's, a, what's striking is that if you look at in this top graph here, look at the pattern here. The red is king, and this is king overlapping. These are the words that I kind of track them, but these are all these words down here, all their vectors, you know, it's a, the word 2,000 or the word word published, and, uh, and the pattern is pretty damn good. And if you take the word uh, um, uh, man, that's a root word, remember, man plus queen minus woman. If you take the word man, you can see how far off you are. It's a pretty basic. And so this is, a, this is sort of a good way to get a better test. It's not, and it's not in an abstract vector space where you don't know what the hell the axes actually mean. Actually, just different words pointing different directions in this big dimensional space, and you can sort of see how this pattern looks. And that's sort of a nice way you can compute a kind of a goodness statistic from that, and uh, some other things. I'm not going to go into all that detail, but uh, it's a pretty nice way to look at word vectors. 
And uh, so that's, a, that's just a little trick. I, I don't think I have that code in the example here, uh, but it's, it's super easy. To, I mean, it's a trivial thing to do. So um, let's talk about why 45 degrees is a good thing. So I'm a, remember, I'm an ex-physicist. So that implies a certain amount of torture. Uh, this is it. <laughs> so um, if you think about, remember, we're 300 dimensional sphere. You know, uh, what does an angle theta mean in this sphere? Well, if you talk about a two sphere, the, the ratio of the arc of an angle theta to the circumference of that sphere is just uh, theta over pi, all right? But as you go into higher dimensionality, the, the numbers change quite a bit. So theta, remember theta is a small number, is uh, to the n. So think of 0.1 or point to the n, and then over 2 to the n. So this is, you know, this sphere is just huge. And so even a 45 degree angle agreement between vectors is, you know, statistically in the space of all possible vectors, hugely significant. And that's, that's something that's, that's not, uh, it took me a while to figure that out. So I <laughs> drew a picture and looked up some math on Wikipedia. I can't do this stuff anymore, but that's, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty astounding result. And man, doesn't it look cool with the kind of like pseudo chalk stuff? And <laughs> that, that took longer than actual math. <laughs> um, uh, so diving into politics. So uh, did anybody, has anybody ever seen the movie Inherit the Wind? My God, we just, I just watched that the other night. I saw this quote from Clarence Darrow. I was like, I got to see that movie again. Recorded in 1916, it seems like progressive politics. Isn't that scary? Um, when I was a boy, I was told that anybody could become president, and I'm beginning to believe it. That's where we are today. So, um, so let, let me just talk a little bit about some of the work that I, I've done here. This is going to go fast, and it's not going to be very deep. Um, but the, um, you know, one of the things I did was I just computed candidate word vectors. So I took a bunch of word, the words that they said, I added all the vectors up, normalized it to unity, took the dot product, boom, angle. Um, at first, I was a little discouraged. I said, damn, these angles are small. Then I did that math, and I realized it's okay. And, uh, uh, but what you see, this, so this is a little bit of the science that I did. You know, it depends on how you compute the vectors. So I, I computed them under different assumptions, and plotted this trend here. And you can see, this is, um, you can see just in standard, the angle is pretty small, 190 milliradians. And, uh, you know, for instance, the difference between uh, Sanders and Trump is 260 milliradians. The difference between Clinton and Cruz is 220 milliradians. Like, well, that's small, but it turns out that that difference persisted. And uh, so the graph below just is a plot of different word selections and things like that, um, pushing farther out into the distribution. And you can see, you know, near in when, when you've got a bunch of, of uh, very high count words, the, the differences are quite profound. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a repeatable trend over lots of assumptions and things like that. So I thought that was sort of an interesting piece of data science that, to do. And uh, I'll, uh, I'm continuing to work on that one. The, um, um, you can look, start to look at uh, candidates in context. So I you know, had a lot of fun playing with different words. And so this, this has a lot to do with how you do the regular expressions. And uh, I'm not going to, I don't want to bore you with all that detail, but uh, one, of the, one of the fun things I started to play with was this idea of um, where do the candidate positions end up relative to some hot button words like people, country, and taxes. And depending on how you do the, the analysis, you can end up with a situation like this, where you've sort of got the people and country over here, and you've got the candidates sort of grouped in the middle between taxes. Um, but if you... Uh, change the way you stem the words a little bit, uh, you can end up with this kind of a funny interpretation, <laughs> which, I, which I think is sort of, sort of, sort of interesting. It says, it's a, it, you, could, you could almost argue that this is the idea that um, you take a country, you add people to it, you get rid of taxes, and that's where the candidates live. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a funny outcome. And, uh, and you know, I can, um, 
uh, you know, this is one of those challenges where you want to make sure you're printing exactly the conditions you're operating under because these are, um, um, but anyway, this, this is a, it's sort of a, an interesting way to, to look at the data. And, and I think the approaches like this will promise to give us some, some, uh, some interpretability to the data long term. Uh, we're, um, uh, you know, I, I hope you're not expecting huge insights here. You know, I, I, if you want a private opinion, I could tell you who's an idiot, who isn't. But the, um, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at, I looked at um, the way the way candidate positions vary, and I think this is for, so this is for uh, again uh, the hundred up to the first twenty words of the candidates. It's a bag of words, vectorized. No filtering of the text. Uh, you know, the vector space had 1,200 roughly uh, uh, vectors from the zero-dimensional vectors, and you can see that. Um, you know, the idea that uh, uh, sort of the idea that Sanders and Clinton minus Trump it gives you uh, uh, Carlo Rubio or what's his face Cruz, and um, the um, that uh, I don't know if that means anything or not, but it's. Uh, you can start to see what the um, what the you know how these things lay out in, in the vector space. Yeah, I don't know what it means either, uh, but it's just sort of <laughs> this is the one that worked out, so I thought it was sort of interesting. You know, it's, it's sort of fun, and uh, you know the the what I'm trying to do is, but what I'm really trying to do, what I'm trying to do is to establish differences between candidates. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do in the meta picture, right? So I'm trying to look at how do these guys compare to each other. How can I jumble them up in a way so that I can create an AI to say, take what this guy got, filter it, take the AI, take, take what this guy says, use, uh, use what he said, filter the debate text of that guy, match it, subtract the text from the other candidate, create a tweet response. That's sort of the, the vision that I have sort of the architecture I'm trying to work toward. And, uh, um, you know, it, and, and so that's, that's the ex exploration I'm trying to do. How do I, how do I seed uh, a Markov text or tweeter based on vector interpretations of tweets? That's sort of the, the big picture thing. Um, if, if you, it, you know, some of the things I'm exploring. So I, I tried to look at, well, what words align to candidates best? You know, it turns out not much interesting there. You get you get you get an answer. So this is just what words match best. I think there's a word to vec function along these lines. And you know, if you say take Bernie's first, here's 16 words. I filter the text for things related to just the word terror. So I look only for terror in the in the debates, and uh, uh, you end up with a bunch of junk, right? This this is just you know we want to think should going what but. Mm -t. <laughs> this is where the tokenization comes in, uh, because it. I mean, those are all great matches from the vector space, but they don't mean much. I started, uh, yeah, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they don't have any semantic value, exactly. And so, so then I, yeah, so, so thank you. So that's actually a good suggestion. So I, that's why I'm glad I'm talking to professionals here. <laughs> <laughs> really, because I'm like, what the hell do I do? But anyway, yeah, these don't have much semantic value. And so I can go farther down the list, right? And, uh, and that's a good suggestion. Um, uh, you know, say, uh, let's see, I can go to the word ISIS. So I go to the word ISIS, I start to get more interesting results. Uh, you know, troops, forces, people, you know, there's some stop words, they, them, soldiers, uh, starts to sound a little bit more like the stuff you would say in a conversation about ISIS, right? And, uh, uh, and then, and, and this, is, this is actually exactly what you said, this is going deeper into the text, right? This is getting a rid of the junk on the sort of float, the phone that's sort of floating to the surface and going deeper into what, what he says. Um, another, uh, you know, so, so what happens when you do this filtering? So here's a filtering, Trump, where I really use a hard filter, starts and stops with the word wall. Um, 
And you know, these are these are sort of the comments that I'm taking into account. This is how the how the thing works. So this is the this is, well, these are the things that Trump some of the things that Trump said that had the word wall in it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. All right, so let's keep going. <laughs> um, so what happens? So so you know, if I uh, one of the interesting things I found, if you take the differences between candidates, so you take the candidates, you subtract one from the other. And you filter the text for the word, in this case, wall, what do I get? Well, you know, it, it starts to sound sort of interesting. It gets rid of a lot of the stop words, probably because the stop words all sort of float, maybe because the stop words are all floating to the top. I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to understand why the stop words are gotten rid of. Yeah. I, I like this. I like this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 See, and I thought, yeah, that's great. So that's perfect. That that's that's totally worth all the work to put these slides together right there. <laughs> And uh, and you know this starts to sound interesting, right? I, I hope I, there's some funny that ones. Well, maybe derivable, but they're they're like junk. It's like it's like whether you cook chicken soup or uh, okay, they're not junk, but it's like. It, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. So one of the things I and, and, and actually and, and and actually I found that empirically just in this analysis. So when I would take the word, for instance, terror, when I did the when I did the word analysis, I'd want to get rid of the word terror because it it was everywhere, right? Yeah. Okay. So good. All right. So I'm justified in doing that. That's that's good to know. Actually, in, the, in here. It, it's not really a stop word, but it's but it's the pervading context of the whole conversation, and that's and, and yeah yeah. So anyway, and, and you can see here, for instance, here I, I just dumped the the first five words of the list because they were non-meaningful in this context. They were they contained word wall and the word whatever, and so but but you can you can see here that Trump and Cruz, if you look at the word wall, you get differences like stuff, border, refugees, guys, Sudanese. You know, refugee, Rwanda. You know, it 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 starts to sound like the conversation they're having, and you could totally make if you wanted to do a Trump response to Hillary. Hillary, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to say this, but so funny. You could make a totally racist tweet out of this, and it would be perfect. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, and it, it comes right out. Of, it comes it comes right out of what they're thinking. I mean, that's a funny thing. And so oh, I didn't. Damn it! I, I had some really funny ones. I, I don't have them in here. Sorry. The um, um, I guess I'm to the conclusion part. So what I want to do now, I'll just kind of hit this conclusion thing, and then I, I was going to show you some of the code that I use, just to uh, you know, it's not not great code, and I could use some pointers. Uh, but the, the the speech is strongly distinguished by bags of words. Um, I was actually surprised that I could see differences. And another another interesting lesson is. You know, if you look at the debates, the first thing I thought was, oh, this debate's about the economy and this one's about terrorism. And I, they're going to be different words. No. <laughs> These guys say the same thing. Doesn't matter what, what question they're asked, right? And you can really see that in bags of words. Um, Pre-computed word vectors are pretty dang cool. I think, uh, you know, you don't need to, like, go out and spend 50 bucks at Amazon to compute your own. You can, uh, you can, you can do this yourself. Um, I was surprised at how much tooling I needed to build to do this analysis. I got like, I probably wrote 30 little functions to just do different things that I needed to do. And it was sort of fun. R is great for that stuff. I mean, and, uh, and then, you know, you can start to see differences in speech. Um, you know, I'm not a pro at this by any means. I'm just trying to get to an objective, but uh, deconstructing uh, political speech, definitely definitely feasible. And, um, you know, I really thank people for the pointers tonight. 
Um, where am I going? Well, you know, I'm continuing to explore code, so I got a lot to learn about getting, I'm going to start getting rid of stop words and doing more, being more aggressive there. I mean, I got some pros here saying I can do that, so I'm taking that as permission to go ahead. And, uh, you know, I'm, Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to run both ways. But I, I, what I want to do is 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 use this stuff to sort of get the meat of what I want, and then just use a Markov uh, chain to generate the speech that's seated. Yeah. And uh, and and you know, is AI possible in politics? No, but we're gonna have fun with it anyway. So that's sort of the conclusion of the pre prepared version of this thing. And um, I thought what I'd do is just sort of go through a little bit of the code. Um, I, I have, oh, go ahead. Uh, you know, I did not, um, but that, that could be interesting. Yeah, that could be interesting. You could definitely, you, mm, uh, I mean, you you could detect some. I mean, depending on what you were looking for, it would be possible. Yeah. Yes, I use the TM package. Yeah. Uh, the main the main, I'll, I'll show you what I did. Um, so here it is. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, this is probably good enough. Uh, um, so this is, I write in the RM, you know, the, I like to have text in the middle so I can, you always write, the, what is the thing? You're always writing code for two people, yourself and your future self. And, uh, and the, um, so I always like to add a lot of comments. So let, let's go through this and I'll just show you what I do. And you can give me feedback on any parts of this because I'm a hacker, not a pro, okay? Can, can you guys see this? You're going to have to tell me what to do here to do that. Is there a way to do that? Oh, zoom in. Okay. How's that? Much better? Yeah, it's actually better for me. I think I'm going to leave it like this. <laughs> All right. So here, let's go through this. So, uh, you know, this is just standard stuff here. Um, I got a few little little things. Uh, I always throw my HTML stuff up in. Uh, uh, do you want me to run this first so you can see what it produces? Why not? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Especially because the last time I looked at this thing, I was drinking beer over at the Rogue. So. <laughs> yeah, it is running. It's. It'll pop up in a minute. It takes a while to run because it's got to, we'll just let it go. Uh, I'll, um, 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 so anyway, I throw all my HTML junk up in the front and it, there it is. So uh, here it is. So I always put a summary, data sources and methods. I like to throw some code in. Here's the, one of the tables. I think this is filtered. Yeah. So here I, this, this is a filter bill. So I'm experimenting with the word wall right now. Okay. So. Um, and not, no, you know, just, just the word wall. And uh, you could, so this takes that word vector table I showed you and it's reduced down a little bit. My sums aren't quite working. I don't know, I gotta fix those. But, you know, it's sort of an interesting wall, right? Mentioned by everything but Carlo Rubio, who knows why, <laughs> you know? But it, it, this is one of the challenges is that um, there'll always be a candidate who's like, you know, an exception. So you gotta write a lot of error handling. and. Uh, and that's one of the problems I faced. But, but you can see, you know, Trump. Uh, so these are these are some of the words that they say. Um, this gives the vocabulary data down here. Here's the the heat map of that word. Uh, you'll see that. I'll show you in a second. Um, you know, I'm getting this warning because I forgot about that. This is the loading the glove vectors. Here are some of the words. Uh, here's some of the vectors. This is the plot of the vectors. And here's, I, I actually have also a plot of the delta from the mean because there wasn't a lot of signal in the thing. The delta from the mean doesn't say much, but it looks a little cooler. 
Um, here's that data that I showed you earlier that I did a trend plot on. And then here's a bunch of uh, some of the things. Here's people, country, and taxes. I keep, this is sort of one of the standard things I do. This one doesn't come in too well. Uh, country and people line up here. Those are the two vectors I use to align the principal components. And then I compute the variance from those. And so um, these guys are close to people, pretty far from tax, not surprising. Uh, that's usually the way it ends up. Uh, here's uh, Trump and Sanders just looking at, you know, how do the candidates, if I line the vector space to maximize the difference between those two guys, how does everything else line up, right? Um, and in this case, there's not, you know, they're at a 45 degree. That, what that means is that there's zero information there. That's what that, that's exactly what that means. And uh, not much information there. We start to look at word, you know, this is the word frequency tables. Um, Here's Sanders minus Trump, and you can see uh, some differences there. Uh, I've thrown away a few of the first words, the, stop, the top junk that drifts to the top. And, and that, anyway, that's what that code looks like. And here's, oh yeah, this is the funny one. <laughs> I looked at the pairing of Cruz minus the word friend. And uh, what comes to the top? Boyfriend. <laughs> I think it was funny. It's a lover. <laughs> Anyway, I, th I think it's sort of funny. Um, and uh, um, anyway, that's sort of that's sort of where where this uh, that, that that's sort of what that this is what this code produces, right? Uh, just one of the things that I did. And um, so let's go back to uh, what I hate. Uh, you uh, let's see, is it view that I want? Source. That's what I want. And uh, um, so let's go through, we can go through and just sort of show things. So this is sort of how I do things. I try to keep all my code chunks and descriptors. Uh, so the first thing I do is I go through my, my debate files are just stored. These debate files are too big to like sync with GitHub. And I don't want to pay the large file thing. So I just keep them local. I'm try, I was trying to work out a way where I could go out, grab the zip file, rip it open online, grab lines and bring it back in. Everybody knows how to do that. What's that? No, I don't want to use Dropbox. I want to use, I, want, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't even want to grab the file. I just want to go out and read the lines within a zip file that are out on the web someplace. Um, no, the, the word vector, the word vectors, are, the debate files are nothing. The word vectors are like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, word vectors are massive, and so, so, oh yeah, so this, oh, oh yeah, sorry, so, so I, I was speaking incorrect, so I'm sorry, I did, I was wrong. So these are the debate files, so I just have them on a thing, I just go in and, you know, they're, they're titled, so I just grab the titles, I, uh, um, um, and then I load them, oh, these are, oh, they, yeah, they, I load them, these are a bunch of the local functions that I wrote, uh, loading debate text, candidate text, uh, multi-plot, uh, vector normalization, just a few fu functions that I've stored locally on my, you know, I, they, they junk up your code when you get a bunch of these functions. So I like to throw them into a, a file. Um, the uh, libraries are here, getting the text files. I think this is pretty straightforward. Yeah, I just, you know, use a simple, the file names in the re list of Republican files, you, you grab it and, uh, um, you know, I've been, slowly shifting all my stuff to using these pipes because it just makes the code so much more readable. And um, uh, I don't know, Scott, you want to you tackle that one? <laughs> That's a, yeah, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's just a program. It's intended to communicate between people and machines. <laughs> It's a programming language. It's, it's yeah. So anyway, yeah. So that so so that this pre, this is pretty straightforward stuff. And um, so let's see. Let me go down here. So I keep my filters and my words. Candidate word frequency. You want to look at um, heat map. So here's the heat map. And it probably isn't going to help you too much because it's only. Um, yeah, 
All right, well, let's just look at the GG plot part of this thing. So, <laughs> you, so uh, a lot of the trick is getting the data into a format where you can actually plot it like this. Okay, that's the hard part, actually. Once you get it there, it, the the plot works. But this was pretty straightforward. So. Um, uh, ggplot, here's the, the data file, and I, I use the words as a factor on the x-axis and the candidate frequency, it's called candidate, on the y-axis. Um, the geom tile is what I use, and you just color it white, the, in, the white so you don't screw up the, the tiles, and then you fill it. And uh, I, used, I just picked some colors here. Um, the midpoint, I, I messed around with the midpoint quite a bit, but the best thing worked out to be taking the, just the maximum and dividing it by two, putting it right in the middle. Um, I assign it an A value, but it never gets used, and then there's, uh, that's, and that's really all there is to that heat map. The, uh, um, you know, there is a, you're, you are, uh, um, let me see if I, if there's anything in here. Yeah, this is actually pretty simple. I just, um, let me see if I can think what I'm doing. Here. Oh, oh yeah. What I do for each of the um, candidates is I, I basically am normalizing those frequencies. And then, and then you just use the reshape. I just melted it. It's just as simple as just melting. Uh, uh, melt worked great, actually. And uh, what's that? I know, I know, actually, yeah, okay, you know what I'm going to do right now? Use D plier. Okay, there's the comment right there. Yeah, I, yeah, and uh, thanks. And, yeah, and actually, yeah, we just had, anyway, yeah, melt, I'm, I'm now getting rid of it in all my code because I was just at a talk this week, we had, got lucky and Hadley was in Santa Clara for some of the user group thing. And he gave a talk at our group and, uh, and he was like, nah, I don't use uh, Melt anymore. That's uh, like old school shit. And so now he's using something else. And so I'm trying to try to get to that. The D plier would work good. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, and then I don't know, there's, let's see, um, loading word vectors. So this is what my word vector loader looks like. I, I just pick a number of words I want to do. Um, I use close to, t if you go to 10,000, it starts printing scientific notation everywhere. I hate that. So um, um, I, do kind of, I do keep track of how much time it takes to load these things just because it's a pain. Um, the, you know, one of the things I like to do is always include in a comment what you're actually supposed to get uh, when you run the code. So the first few words of the word, the word list that you get out of the vector is already it's just a bunch of, a bunch of stop words. And... Uh, Pros, yeah, and so, so, yep. Uh, let's see, we can go through. Um, this is sort of one way uh, to to uh, communi to calculate a, a vector. You know, this is this one I didn't I didn't fix yet, but uh, I wrote a uh, you know, um, it's just you just take a graph, you find the word in a column. That's the if some uh, one of the differences I find is that depending on how I do it, so if I get rid of the dollar sign at the end, for instance, on the word tax, tax is a good one. Because if you get rid of the dollar sign, suddenly you get tax, taxation, taxes, tax, taxi, taxer, tax it. And, uh, and it changes the con, it changes a lot the results. And that's, um, it's subjective, but um, it, you know, it, it seems to, to point in better directions often. So, so those are some of the things that you would do here. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, I did write a function called vectorize, which uh, uh, later on, so this is vectorizing wall, and that just takes the word wall. Doesn't take anything associated with it. And then I, I have a bunch of computing standard vectors. These are some, some of the words. I just found it simpler just to compute a bunch of words and um, and so fear you vectorize the word and then you normalize it and these are that's what I've done to all these things right so um, um, that worked pretty well um, and, uh, and that's how I you know and 
and you, you can, you know, the, you, you know, I play around with a lot of these things like uh, compassion. You know, it's sort of funny to see how compassion lines up with these guys. And, uh, and uh, um, that's sort of it. Let's see, there was a place in here where I was having some problems I wanted to get some input on. Uh, here's the idea, that in a, when you pipe something, there's an assumption that um, the first element of the function is the, is, the, is the thing that's getting piped to it. And a lot of times, the way our functions are written, it's actually the second element of the function. You guys ever run into that problem? Oh, there's a, oh is there a trick? God damn, see, that's why I love coming here. What, what, do, you, what do you do? So where do you put the dot? Oh. oh, okay, I got to look that up because I, I wrote a bunch of functions to like say, okay, I want, I want to put this in the third thing. So use thirdarizer and you <laughs> flip the order of the variables. <laughs> Okay, if I look up pipe operator dot or something like that on Google. Okay, I don't even know who that is, but. Okay. I know exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's 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 how. I mean, I was like, I was like, hey, I know how to do this. How is? Oh yeah, I've done this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. So dots. Okay, I'll I'll look that up. That that's a big help. Um, yeah, there's some place. Anyway, anyway, this is what the code looks like. I'm, I'll put this on GitHub. If anybody, I'll put this in the PowerPoint on GitHub or or whatever it is. I'll put it as a PDF on GitHub if you guys want to can have any of this code, it's obviously open source. And um, I don't know, that's sort of it. Um, I'll be happy, you know, take me probably about six months to get my Twitter thing going, the election will be over, but I'll be tweeting like mad. And uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's sort of my plan. It's the next thing I want to do is get that Twitter, you know, there's, you know, with the, with Tay, the Microsoft Tay thing and uh, the competition's out there. I got I got to meet it, and uh, so that's that's sort of the goal next. Let's, let's do that. Okay. Thanks.